So just a quick word to share with y'all for the evening. Living in awe from Parsha Vayelech. He went, as we, uh, as we heard, from Deuteronomy 31, 1 through 30, as Rabbi Jay was, uh, was mentioning. Just one chapter. Uh, we are very quickly approaching the end of the Torah. Amen. And so for those that haven't heard uh, for the uh, Vezot, and we might like to do it uh, in the future at some point, but as, as the Torah is read, the Torah itself, um, not just the, the portion, but the actual verses, more and more of the scroll ends up on one side of, of the, uh, they're called, the, yeah, of like the, the poles, basically. So toward the end, the person is handling like all 30, 40, 50 pounds, like on one arm, whenever they lift it up for the, uh, for the vessel. So uh, at least where me and Claudia came from, there were very often people that were helping hold them up because their arms were like shaking halfway through it, and we did not want to drop the Taurus scroll. Um, and so thankfully that, in our experience, never happened, and hopefully it doesn't ever. But, um, but it does help bring a, a literal picture to the weight of God's word in our lives. May it always carry weight. Amen. Man, I'm going to switch mics real fast. But I invite you to take a look at the picture here. The reason for titling the message as such, Living in Awe, these 10 days between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur are traditionally referred to as the days of awe, as the days of awe, and particularly a time traditionally for uh, introspection of becoming uh, right with the Lord, you might say. And for us as believers in Messiah, we see him as the ultimate sacrifice. But it serves at least as a reminder that if we have not, for whatever reason, done it throughout the year, at least during this time, to give renewed attention to our relationship with God, our relationship with fellow humanity, uh, righting wrongs as best we can, again, trusting that before the Lord, it is the blood of Messiah that makes us right. That being said, the, uh, the goal, the goal of, of such days, the goal of the, the, the feast days, mentioned it before, but I just threw a picture up here. I felt like it was fitting. Uh, a caterpillar, and I looked it up just to, just to make sure. Feel free to fact check me. But a caterpillar, when a caterpillar goes into a cocoon and becomes a, a butterfly, um, is anybody familiar with what happens to the caterpillar? It liquefies. I did not know that. It essentially dies. Its organs dissolve. There is essentially nothing left of the caterpillar. So in, in, a, in, a, in a quite literal fashion, it dies and is born again as a new creature, right? And it looks very different. It looks very different. It has wings. Its body looks even smaller. It just looks totally different. But it's, it's quite a literal picture that we can see in nature of, of something that Somehow, somehow, and I maybe didn't look that far into it, but I, I welcome you to. I would imagine it would be awesome to see what exactly keeps that process going. What exactly is it about this process that something can be born from death? Nonetheless, for our purposes this evening, the 10 days of awe allow us to, to remember salvation uh, and restore sanctification, just to give renewed attention to our relationship, again, with God, with, with fellow humanity, just continually growing in what it means to be set apart as the people of God, set apart in our hearts, set apart in our actions. Uh, this season is especially relevant to that process. So uh, it ended up this message just being a, a bit of a trek through the book of Hebrews so just to throw that out there, we'll be just looking at different passages in fairly chronological order throughout the book of Hebrews. I greatly encourage you to read it as I've done before. It's so awesome. And um, I would say, thankfully, at least for me and Claudia, getting into this particular flow of uh, Messianic uh, celebration of Messiah, there's so much uh, that makes there's, there's, it makes so much more sense reading the book of Hebrews after learning more about this. 
that we do, the Torah. It comes together and it's, I, we, we had heard it referred to as a very mysterious book. It's kind of weird. It doesn't really make sense, but it, it, it makes all the more perfect sense, <laughs> perfect sense with an appreciation for, for the Torah service, for the tabernacle, for the Levitical laws, the sacrificial laws. It's all there to explain and, and in, in some ways a, a, a testament if you will, um, hence the name to the to the Hebrews, or some translations might call it the epistle to the Messianic Jews, even. Um, but even non-believing Jews can definitely get something from it. Deuteronomy 31, verse 1, from the Parsha. Then Moses went and spoke these words to all Israel. He said to them, I am 120 years old today. I am no longer able to go out and come in. Adonai has said to me, you are not to cross over this Jordan. Adonai, your God, he will cross over before you. He will destroy these nations from before you, and you will dispossess them. Joshua will cross over before you just as Adonai has promised. Adonai will do to them just as he did to Sihon and Og, the kings of the Amorites, and to their land when he destroyed them. Adonai will give them over to you, and you are to do to them according to all the mitzvot that I commanded you. Amen. Chazak, be courageous, do not be afraid or tremble before them, for Adonai your God, he is the one who goes with you. He will not fail you or abandon you. So um, to my knowledge, enjoying reading through this Parsha, it's something that we haven't included to date uh, here at Tikva, but at the end of every book, and especially at the end of the reading of the Torah scroll, there's a traditional phrase that is Chazak, Chazak venit chazek, which is be strong, be strong, and may you be strengthened. That is traditionally said. And it, and it was courage that they needed for what was uh, before them, for what they were to do. So Joshua, in particular, the Israelites uh, indirectly were exhorted to have courage, to have courage. The promise of rest, entering into the new land, what they'd been waiting so long for also came with the challenge of conquest. So just imagine, if you will, that feeling of the land flowing with milk and honey, right? The land of plenty, the promised rest. Now go ahead and strap your armor on and get your sword and your shields and that huge fortress right over there, you got to conquer it. And then the next one after, you got to conquer that one, and then the next one, and the next one, right? That doesn't sound a whole lot like rest, perhaps. But rest it was nonetheless as a promise. And so even for us as a picture today, ours is a temporary battle of faith. Why do we say temporary? This life that we live, this life that we live, a temporary battle of faith for an eternal rest in Messiah Yeshua, Messiah Yeshua. And, and we'll read more from scripture with regard to that subject battle of faith for eternal rest, eternal rest. So there's three themes that are followed along through these 10 days of awe that I came across just to share with y'all. The first of them is teshuva or repentance, a turning from. And we'll just read some scriptures in following with this theme of repentance during these 10 days. In Hebrews beginning in chapter 4, what is the relevance of repentance for us in this moment? So then it remains for some to enter into it. This rest, this rest, if you read earlier in the chapter. Yet those who formerly had good news proclaimed to them did not enter because of disobedience. Again, God appoints a certain day today, saying through David, after so long a time, just as it had been said before. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So there remains a Shabbat, a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Are y'all following what he's saying here? So if the rest of Canaan was the only rest there ever was to have, why did David speak of not hardening hearts? As if to imply a rest that is further. Of course, we enjoy the rest that comes with God in eternity and Messiah Yeshua, right? What's being described here? For the one who has entered God's rest has also ceased from his own work, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest, 
so that no one may fall through the same pattern of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing right through to a separation of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart on the inside of a person. No creature is hidden from him, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Therefore, since we have a great Kohen Gadol, a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Yeshua ben Elohim, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to our confessed allegiance to Messiah. For we do not have a Kohen Gadol who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all the same ways, yet without sin. So from this we get the idea that was it possible for Yeshua to sin? Would there be any victory if it was not possible? Right? But Yeshua had the same opportunity to sin as we all have. And that's what made it so special that he didn't. He was tested in all the same ways as us, and he conquered it. Therefore, let us draw near to the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace for help in a time of need. Oh, Lord God, because of him. So Joshua helps to bring rest, the fulfillment of God's promise. But David spoke of another rest, which we understand to be in Messiah himself. So what is the rest of David? Something to ponder. Messiah came not only to endure death, but to overcome it. But to overcome it. It's, uh, it's, in this, it's in this book where we read the passage, it's appointed to man once to die, and after that, the judgment. And it was only through the power of God that Messiah was able to conquer death, not just to endure it. So then... Um, after repentance, after teshuva, there is a prayer or tefillah. Prayer, tefillah, Matthew, uh, excuse me, Hebrews chapter 5. For every Kohen Gadol, every high priest taken from among men is appointed to act on behalf of people in matters relating to God so that he may offer gifts and sacrifices for his sins. He is able to empathize with the ignorant and deluded, since he himself also is subject to weakness. For this reason, he has to make offerings for sins, just as for the people, so also for himself. So the point being made, that even the priests who were representing the children of Israel, they had to make offerings for themselves. They were not above the children of Israel. They were no more god than any of the people that they were serving, if that makes sense. Even though they were called of God to a unique office. And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when he is called by God, as Aaron was. So also Messiah did not glorify himself to be made Kohen Gadol. Yeshua was not God because he made himself God, if that makes sense. Rather, it was God who said to him, You are my son. Today I have become your father. And he says in a different passage, you are a Kohen, a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his life on earth, Yeshua offered up both prayers and pleas with loud crying and tears to the one able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Though he was a son, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. And just, for me, it stuck out reading through the Gospels. Right here, Yeshua offered up both prayers and pleas. I remember reading this a long time ago and thinking about all the times that Yeshua withdrew to the mountain. We read about in the Gospels, and Yeshua withdrew himself, and Yeshua went up. He went alone. He went to be with God. Not that I have it, conclusively, but it seems very apparent that this is probably what he was doing right here. Offering up prayers and pleas with loud crying, with tears, to the one able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. And this process of his life, him being made perfect, made mature, 
being proven to be perfect, being proven to be that spotless lamb, leading by example, called by God, Kohen Gadol, according to the order of Melchizedek. Indeed, every Kohen, every priest stands day by day, serving and offering the same sacrifices again and again, which can never take away sins. I heard somebody say, the goal was not to take away, the goal was to cover over, to cover over, a temporary covering, according to the law of God, where Messiah actually takes them away. We are seen as spotless before the Lord. Like we've talked about before, we bring up our faults, we bring up the wrong things that we've done, and of course there's a place for discipline, and that's not what I mean. But when it comes to remembering all of the wrong and terrible things that we've done after we've repented, after his blood has washed our hearts, God does not look at that. He doesn't see that anymore because it's gone. The old man is gone, has died, has passed away. The only thing that is left is the new. But on the other hand, when this one offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down, Yeshua sat down at the right hand of God. There was no more to be made for him. He doesn't have to get up on the cross and die again, right? That's, that's the point. Waiting from then on until his enemies are made a footstool for his feet. For by one offering, he has perfected forever those being made holy. Those being made holy, being sanctified. You and me. You and me. And just uh, through this in here from Romans chapter 8, it is Messiah who died and moreover was raised and is now at the right hand of God like Hebrews says, but it expands on it and says that Yeshua also intercedes for us, intercedes for us. So Yeshua still has an active role. Where is Yeshua? At the right hand of the Father. What is he doing? Interceding for us. Amen. And that's a good thing because I need that for sure. Glory to God. But it's, it's awesome. Uh, perhaps, and I don't mean this to be limiting in any way, but it's awesome to perhaps get a picture of what's happening in the Trinity as we speak, as we speak, because we believe that God the Father, Son, Holy Spirit are, are real. Uh, but where are they? The Holy Spirit, the Racha Kodesh is in all of us as believers. The Son, where is he? If we search for him on Apple Maps or Google Maps, right? He's at the right hand of the Father interceding for us. At this very moment. And of course, God the Father on his throne, as he always will be. Messiah is our greatest interceder, our example in a prayerful life, what it means to live a prayerful life. So devotion is not merely an objective, but a delightful lifestyle. Not merely a, a, a box to check, basically, is the point of saying it that way. Uh, I remember uh, just growing in, uh, through youth group and just getting a better feel for, for what this, th these things kind of mean practically when it comes time to internalize it, right? I'm not going to church more and more or going to a synagogue, whatever it might be, messiah um, base, of course. Not going just because I'm forced to go anymore. Um, now that, you know, the years are continuing on, I'm, I'm having to reach a point where I'm doing it because I want to do it not because anybody is forcing me to. And as sad as it might be in years past, that has been a, a breaking point for many people, many people, especially getting into college and like open your mind and possibilities, right? And, and knowledge, of course, is, is not, uh, to know a bunch of possibilities does not make those uh, possibilities objectively true. If that makes sense, um, not to, not to get on a soapbox with that. I really like talking about stuff like that. But um, now it's not quite the time. But, um, but yeah, just knowledge. It can be so attractive, right? It was attractive to Adam and Eve, that's for sure, right? And it's just stayed attractive, always. But knowing things and, 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 and doing something that is thoroughly beneficial, it's not necessarily the same thing. Not necessarily the same thing. But the delight in the lifestyle comes from talking and praying to a God, talking with a God who is real, who is real. Not like the statues we read about in, in, in the scripture that it looks real, but if you poke it, it doesn't bleed. If you pray to it, the stone thing, the wooden thing, 
as many times as we might. With the prophet Elijah, they were cutting themselves even. Blood streaming down their arms. Nothing was happening, right? Elijah prayed one prayer and bam, <laughs> lit it up straight from heaven, right? Because it's, it's, as we read in other places in Scripture, it's not about the, 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 the sacrifice of our own blood or whatever it might be, but it's the obedience, simple, easy. Not always easy, but simple. <laughs> May our prayer life be without ceasing as we seek the very best of God. Yeshua himself giving us that example. It might have been very easy to think, you know, I'm the son of God. I don't need to pray. I'm going to pray to myself, right? I am the Lord. I can walk around. I don't need to be with God. But he didn't look at things like that. Even he himself saw it necessary to be with God, to be alone with God, to enjoy that time. One-on-one. -on -one. And may we all do the same. Find a unique place, a unique place, wherever we are. Even a moment, even a moment. And finally, sadaka, good deeds, good deeds, or, or, uh, or charity also is, is another way that that is uh, translated. From Hebrews 11, I felt it on my heart to share this with you all. Hebrews 11, 32, relating this to the idea of tzedakah, of charity, of, uh, of love-driven deeds. For what more shall I say? For time would fail me if I would tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets. By faith they conquered kingdoms, administered justice, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, and made foreign armies flee. Women received their dead raised back to life, and others were tortured after not accepting release so that they might obtain a better resurrection. Others experienced the trial of mocking and scourging, yes, and even chains and prison. They were stoned. They were sawed in two. They were murdered with the sword. They went around in sheepskins and goatskins. They were destitute, afflicted, mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered around in deserts and mountains, caves and holes in the ground. And all these, though commended for their faith, did not receive what was promised because God had provided something better for us so that only with us would they reach perfection, the full body of Messiah. It starts off with things that, that, that make for a, for, a good, for a good hero story. Things that sound awesome in the history books. But just as much obedience to the word of God were the things that looked so much less attractive and painful. But there was a faithfulness to God in all of it. In the fun times and the crazy hard times, the common denominator was, was God that was sustaining them. And Hebrews, uh, Hebrews continues. And finishes up more so with, with this in mind. Let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. For in doing so, some have entertained angels without knowing it. Who does that remind us of? Abraham, right? When the strangers came to him and he gave them bread, he gave them sustenance. And they gave him the prophecy. You're going to have a baby. Remember the prisoners as if you were fellow prisoners, and those who are mistreated as if you also were suffering bodily. Let marriage be held in honor among all, and the marriage bed kept undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterers. Keep your lifestyle free from the love of money, and be content with what you have, for God himself has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. So with confidence we say, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear. What will man do to me? What will man do to me? So what's the motivation of all those, all those uh, saints, they call them, that have gone before us in Hebrews 11, continuing into Hebrews 12? All these people that are described, if we hear about the cloud of witnesses, if you've ever heard that and haven't ever associated that, this is the passage that precedes that because we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. All of those people that went through so much. The Lord is my helper. 
I will not fear. Whether I'm reigning over a kingdom or I'm in a hole in the ground, running for my life, what will man do to me? That's what sustains us. That's what sustains us. And that security, that security allows us to give, to give toward one another in love and even in sacrifice as our Messiah did first for all of us. Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Yeshua the Messiah is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's our ultimate leader, the one we can all look to, for example. So what can we do that is greater than what has been done for us? Amen. Messiah pours eternity into our hearts, that we might then pour out eternally. And uh, didn't say it that way just to sound cute, <laughs> but it's, it's powerful. It's powerful that wherever we are in, uh, in life, it, it, we can maybe feel uh, worn out and feel like, you know, I don't have anything. I don't have anything for you. <laughs> I barely got enough for myself right now, right? But who is it that's refilling us? Who is it that, that, that fills that well of water on the inside of us to overflowing? And when times are hard, when we're battling disappointment, when we're overcoming fear, when we're getting through conflict, it's the joy of the Lord, the love of God, the power of his Holy Spirit that burns on the inside of us to allow us to walk in victory, to live in victory, regardless of where we might be. I'm preaching to myself when I say that. Our faith is not merely performative, but rather transformative. Again, and, and just bringing it all the way, uh, all the way back around to, uh, to that butterfly. Well, before showing you again, <laughs> the little picture. Why do we say it that way? If I, if I might say so, that maybe for many, a process of repentance is, is doing a bunch of things, saying a bunch of things. And absolutely by no means are we saying that there's not a place for that. But why do we do it? Why do we do it? That's the thing that I would say to, uh, to ponder during these days. Why be sanctified? Why pray? Why bless others as we've been blessed? Why repent? <laughs> Why repent? It's not only for ourselves. It's not only for ourselves. But the calling that God has given every one of us, again, it's not just for us, but it's, it's for each other. It's for the world, for all those that don't know God. They've never heard of him, or they've heard of him, and, and just life has been crazy, and they're just not with him right now. And God sees fit to place you and me as his ambassadors to speak into their life. God trusts us with an eternal message that can make or break someone's eternal destiny. And that's, that's powerful. But it's nothing for us to carry in fear because it's his grace that enables us to carry that out. And it's not about avoiding failure, but just becoming so consumed with the love of God. That all we see is him in every moment. All we see is him. We, we hear about that. Just seeing people through the eyes of, of God. And what does that mean? What does that mean? I want, you, I want you with me. I want you to know me. I would not submit that that's all God thinks, but I would imagine that that's at least a part of it. Amen. Amen. So we just we cherish everything that Messiah has done. But I just encourage you, I encourage you, just like this, right? Just like this. That just these days that we enjoy, it's a time of, of awe, of awe before the Lord. That it not merely be about, well, I did all the things, I'm good, I'm good. I said all the things, I did the things, I, I got my checklist, it's all done, and I'm out of here. Until the next time, right? But, but to be transformed. To be transformed. And, and maybe a lot of this is a little redundant, but I feel like it's important nonetheless just during this season 
just to say, Lord, am I, am, am, am I doing this from a place of I want to? I want to because I love you, because you're so good. I want to be here with you in this moment, learning more about what it means to, to be like you. As Messiah makes us like you, your character, if you get what I mean. It's so powerful. It's so powerful. Glory, God. It's pretty much it. <laughs> I invite you to bow your heads as we conclude. Glory to God. Well, Father, we thank you for this opportunity, Lord, to just enjoy your word, enjoy your presence together for a little while. And just pray that it's been your spirit that speaks. And we thank you for a time of peace, for a time of just uh, stepping away from our normal lives and just fixing our attention on you and who you are. Or that before any of this existed as we see it, Lord, you saw us. Lord, and before we had ever fallen, you had a plan to bring us back. Before we had ever said no to you, Lord, before we had ever rejected you, before we had ever walked away from you, you saw fit to, to bleed your blood, to die your death for a chance that we would take you back. And we rejoice that through Messiah Yeshua, Lord, this is, this is a joyful time of saying, I want to be more like you, Lord, your character. I want to be made right with those around me as best as I can to love them, to be a blessing, to be an encouragement, that when we're around each other, we're strengthened. We're strengthened in our faith. We're strengthened in our walk. That this is the, that ideally, Lord, that this would be the most peaceful place Lord, where we can come to be encouraged, not just from a stage, Lord, but, but through one another, through one another, and that all of us, everyone in here, Lord, would walk in your power of your Holy Spirit to be a reflection of your Son, Messiah, everywhere that we go into this, into this new year. Lord, and we thank you for that. We trust that we have it through the blood of Messiah, and we praise you now for it. And it's in Messiah's name, in Yeshua's name, we pray. Amen. 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 Glory to God. We invite you to your feet as we prepare.